and welcome to the podcast, An Intelligent Look at Terrorism. I'm your host, Phil Gursky, President of Borealis Threat and Risk Consulting in Ottawa, Canada. How many of you have ever heard of the Muslim Brotherhood? It's been around for quite some time, and it has a bit of a, a checkered record, I would say, over, over time and over countries. Some people see it as a terrorist group, some see it as a political party. Of course, we had a, a Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt a few years ago until the military took over. So what should we think about the Muslim Brotherhood? And more importantly, as I'm speaking to you from Canada, does the Muslim Brotherhood pose any threat to our democracies or to our societies? I'm very, very fortunate today that I don't have to answer those questions because I have with me as my guest, Dr. Lorenzo Vidino, who is an old friend of mine. He is currently the director of the program on extremism at George Washington University, and he is a specialist on Islamism in Europe and North America. And more importantly, he's been looking at the Muslim Brotherhood and there's what he calls Muslim Brotherhood inspired organizations for the better part of the last two decades. So Lorenzo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to be on the podcast. Well, I'm thrilled that you're part of it because I, you know, if there's one person that I've been reading over the last few years who is the go-to guy when it comes to Muslim Brotherhood, specifically Muslim Brotherhood in the West, it's you. So for my listeners that don't really have any kind of background whatsoever on the MB, can you just give us a really short history of who they are, where they came from, and at least what they say they stand for? Yeah, absolutely. It's the oldest and most influential Islamist organization. In the world, it created in 1928 in Egypt, uh, it basically uh, sees public and private life as being both uh, shaped by their interpretation of Islam, but what I think it's non-controversial to call a very conservative interpretation of Islam, and they aspire to the creation of uh, an Islamic uh, uh, regime. Uh, through a gradual approach that sees a slow Islamization, let's say grassroots Islamization. So proselytism, making people embrace their very conservative and politicized interpretation of Islam. And once the whole population has that uh, um, worldview, then an Islamic political order would uh, automatically flow. Uh, as I said, it was created in, uh, in, the twi- in the late 20s in Egypt, but it uh, basically left Egypt as an ideology already in the early 30s. And nowadays, in basically every single Muslim-majority country, so not just Arab, but from Morocco to Indonesia, there are entities uh, that uh, one can consider as branches, spin-offs of the Muslim Brotherhood, or at least they have adopted a large part of the ideology and the methodology of the Brotherhood. What I look at is something, as you correctly pointed out, even more niche, if you will, which is the entities, the individuals, the networks um, that have historical, organizational, and ideological ties to the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, in Europe, and in North America. And of course, they are somewhat different because one thing is operating in a Muslim majority, in a Muslim majority society, like Egypt, like Indonesia, like uh, Pakistan, like Morocco. Uh, but of course, the peculiarity of brotherhood entities in, uh, in the West is that they operate in societies in which Muslims are uh, a minority. Uh, and of course, that changes the way the group sees the world, how it operates, and what its ambitions are. If I could just, and before we get to talk about the, the their role in the West, which, as you say, is your specialty and it's my interest as an old, you know, security service guy, if you could summarize, what is the main issue that some governments have with the MB, whether it's the Egyptian government or the Indonesian government? What what is it about the Muslim Brotherhood that bothers them and which leads them to not want them to assume power? Because if memory serves me correct, the uh, election in Algeria in the early '90s, I could be wrong on this. Was there a Muslim Brotherhood? Um, aspects of that. There certainly was a Muslim Brotherhood aspect to the elections in Tunisia after the Arab Spring. So what is it about the Muslim Brotherhood that makes local officials, military, whatever, a little bit nervous? And why do they try to have elections in which the Brotherhood is not going to win? What is it that bothers them about them? Well, there's two ways of looking at that. Um, one is that there simply are a challenge to the power of uh, what are mostly uh, authoritarian regimes. 
right. of course, any entity, whether Islamist or not, that challenges uh, that control of the state that these regimes have is problematic to them. Uh, many regimes in the Arab world crack down on all kinds of opposition, brotherhood, the secular, and whatnot. Uh, now, of course, the specific problem with the Brotherhood is the idea that it will uh, completely change society, that will basically use the democratic uh, process uh, in a way that is purely opportunistic. It's the famous quote that Erdogan uh, used a few years ago, uh, democracy is like a streetcar, we'll use it until we need it and then we'll get off. <laughs> um, and the idea was exactly that in, in Algeria in the early 90s, uh, the Islamists, uh, uh, very much with the Brotherhood as part of a coalition, but pretty much leading that coalition, won the election. And there was a concern on the part of the Algerian government and many of its backers in, uh, in the West that once they won an election, uh, they would hold on to power in undemocratic ways. And govern in a way that is problematic on many fronts, from foreign policy to policies implemented domestically. Uh, Wasn't the, the other is, phrase that... Sorry. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, guys, sorry. There's a very, uh, aside from uh, how we judge these policies and how we judge their commitment to democracy, the final uh, issue is their murky, and I'm being diplomatic here, relationship to violence. Uh, the fact that the Brotherhood does not make necess violence necessarily its number one tactic. It, it, it is a mistake to lump it together with jihadist groups uh, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, so on and so forth. But at the same time, it is equally incorrect to, to say that the Brotherhood has renounced violence completely. The Brotherhood takes a much more flexible approach in which it uses violence when it thinks that it's the most appropriate tactic to achieve its goals and it will use other tactics in other environments. Okay, I'm going to pick up on that in a second. The, the other phrase, you mentioned what Erdogan said in Turkey. The other phrase I remember is that, you know, their version of democracy is one man, one vote, one time. So if you vote us into office, you're not going to get a yeah. chance to vote us out of office. Um, so the whole, the, you know, the whole use of violence kind of thing, th does that sort of stem back to the origins of the of the Muslim Brotherhood, where they, they reserve that as an option down the road? And is that why people get a little bit nervous when Muslim Brotherhood organizations either uh, assume governance or are, are prohibited from doing so, the fear that they're going to turn violent to get their way? Is that kind of what people think? Violence is a part of the Muslim Brotherhood credo. That has not changed substantially from the early days. Even in its inner workings, the Brotherhood always had sort of a military wing inside it, what they call the secret apparatus that existed from the early days of Hassan al-Banna uh, till now. And we have, if we just move the analysis to today, uh, several instances in which the Brotherhood, for one reason or the other, and we can get into the, the details, decides to use violence. Hamas being the, uh, the yeah. Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Just the violence. It's not the mm -hmm. only thing that Hamas does. It also governs. Uh, mm -hmm. It also provides social services, but it does clearly engage in violence. If you look at places like Syria, like Libya, like Yemen, clearly the Brotherhood is engaged in violence and often working with jihadist groups, which we see as more radical. In other settings, and you mentioned Tunisia, for example, uh, the local branch of the Brotherhood uh, has not directly engaged in violence. It has been part of the democratic process over the last decade, and it has actually done so in a fairly mature way, accepting defeat at the, uh, uh, when elections came. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one big family, and I think this is one point that one need to, needs to understand. At this point, it's probably more correct to talk about brotherhoods in the plural mm -hmm. form, uh, because indeed there's one sort of body of general ideology to which all the different branches and groups and subgroups adhere to, but it's fair that the way the trajectory uh, that the Tunisian Brotherhood adopts is different from that of the Jordanian Brotherhood, and it's different from that of the uh, Yemeni Brotherhood, and so on and so forth. They adapt to local circumstances, uh, and so they have fairly complete independence in deciding uh, the tactics to adopt. I'm 
I'm glad you raised that point, Lorenzo, that there are several brotherhoods and not just one overarching. You're right, there's sort of an inner sanctum, you will, that sort of sets the agenda, but they do adapt to local circumstances. So moving on to your own particular specialization, you look at the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. The first question I would have for you, why would the Muslim Brotherhood see the West as a sphere in which they wanted to work. They obviously, they were created in Egypt. As you said, they operate largely throughout the Islamic world, both Arab and non-Arab. What is it about the West that drew their attention and, and what led them to take action? And then more importantly, based on your research, how extensive is the Muslim Brotherhood influence in the West writ large? And by West, I mean, you know, Canada, United States and, and Western Europe. Yeah. Um, very good questions that would, would require long, very long answers. I'll try to be brief. Uh, first of all, it, it's not like the Brotherhood consciously decided in the 1950s and 60s when it first moved to the West to go to the West for strategic purposes, to create a presence here. It kind of happened. It happened because um, a few seasoned leaders of the Brotherhood uh, were escaping the crackdown in their countries of origin, mostly Egypt and Syria, uh, and found asylum in the West. And at the same time, around that, that, that very, uh, there are a few individuals, arguably a larger number, that came to the West to pursue their studies, mostly graduate studies. But we have to remember the Brotherhood is an elite group. I'm hard-pressed to think of a single member of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West who does not have at least a graduate degree. So they came as students, they came as refugee because life brought them to the West. It wasn't like a concerted plan a con uh, concocted in, uh, uh, in Cairo to Islamize the West, not at all. Uh, but once they arrived to the West, uh, they set up a presence. Many of these individuals stayed for the rest of their life and created the first Muslim organizations, mosques, a variety of entities that sought to continue doing what the Brotherhood did in, uh, in the East. They saw it as an opportunity. That in the West, they could do things that back home they couldn't. They could raise money. They could uh, uh, print their, uh, their propaganda materials. They could speak openly, something that in Syria, for, in Egypt, for example, they could not do. So the West was the perfect sanctuary for them uh, to operate in. It was for the most part, uh, governments and security services in the West did not really care that much, did not pay much attention to the Brotherhood, and in general did not perceive them as a major threat. Uh, so those networks, of course, grew with time for a variety of reasons, um, from the fact that the Muslim population grew in most, most Western countries, from the fact that they were able to count on very generous funding from uh, most of the Arab Gulf, but not only, uh, and just because of their activism, uh, whether one likes them or not, one thing that everybody will agree is that Brotherhood members are very skilled uh, activists, very well-educated individuals uh, that know the, have learned uh, the environment in the West and know how to operate. So for all these reasons, they set up uh, a presence in the West. And I always say that the goals are twofold in the West and are very different from the East. If in the East, the Brotherhood strives to create an Islamic order, an Islamic society, in the West, the group as, as pragmatic uh, as the Brotherhood does not want to create an Islamic state. And we might have a goal in sort of the back of our mind of kind of a lofty ambition that centuries down the road that we might turn the whole world into a Muslim society. That's, that's what a group like the Brotherhood wants. But, of course, that's not the goal uh, for, for, uh, for the next uh, generations. And the goals are twofold. Are one, uh, influencing Muslim communities in the West, sort of becoming the gatekeepers, becoming the leaders of Muslim communities in the West, creating uh, uh, an infrastructure that shapes Muslim life in the West. And at the same time, um, is seen by Western governments and elites in general as sort of the representatives of Muslim communities. And the second is to shape policy, is to uh, influence Western governments in taking certain positions when it comes to all issues that have to that are dear to to the Muslim Brotherhood's heart. So they understand that the vicissitudes, the trajectories of events in the, in the Middle East are largely influenced by how the West 
behaves, whether they intervene, whether they don't intervene, whether they support the government, whether they don't. And they want to operate as a lobbying group that has some kind of influence in trying to shape that policymaking process. I'm, 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 those are really interesting points that you made. I, I want to pick up on the security services in a second for obvious reasons, but I'm glad you also mentioned the fact that many of the leaders are, are highly educated and, in fact, highly educated in the West, because, of course, for many, one of the most famous or perhaps infamous is the better word, uh, Muslim Brother members is Said Kut, who you know, was studying in Colorado in the late 40s, early 50s. And this is when he had his come to Muhammad moment about jihad. He, he saw things he didn't like in that you know, very open, liberal, secular Western society. And it led him to, re- to write Al-Ma'arif Tariq, Milestones, which many see as sort of the seminal book on Islamist extremism. And of course, Said Kut was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. You talked about the fact that security services and law enforcement agencies and Western governments haven't really paid a lot of attention to the Muslim Brotherhood. When you and I met, of course, I was still working at CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. We had a lot of conversations about Islam and Islamist extremism. Do you think in some ways then that that places like where I used to work, we've kind of dropped the ball and that the Muslim Brotherhood has been able to act sort of without any restraints over the past decades? And that maybe, I mean, hindsight being 2020, that we should have paid a little more attention to them? Would you go as far as saying that? Uh, Generally speaking, yes. Of course, it's a very complicated conversation and uh, every country should be analyzed separately. Um, First of all, it depends on the mandate. There are certain agencies in the West that have a very broad mandate. Germany comes to mind. German security services are not just... uh, uh, The name tells everything. Verfassungsschutz, protection of the constitution. And for right. obvious historical reasons, their mandate is very broad, is to look at every, a, every threat to the democratic order of the Republic of Germany, because they understand, for obvious historical reasons, that entities can use and misuse the democratic process to subvert it. Uh, you have, it, if I, so that, that's, the, that's the BFV you're talking about. That's a, that's a yeah. domestic intelligence service. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the Germans, they look at the Brotherhood very, very intensely. You, anybody can download their uh, annual reports in which the brother, in which there's always a section on the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and the analysis of the German security services of the Brotherhood is extremely tough. Uh, and we see this highly problematic. Uh, why? Also because the Germans don't look at things simply from the terrorism angle. They don't look just at what are immediate security threats. Uh, but not, they're not looking just at those who are putting bombs. They're looking at entities that have a negative impact on German society. Mm. Uh, their mm. argument is twofold as to why they're concerned about the Brotherhood. Uh, one is... Uh, the negative impact on social cohesion, the fact that they disseminate uh, values that are against uh, those of the German constitution within the German Muslim population. And in the long term, that is seen as highly problematic, as polarizing society. The right. second reason why they're concerned is that they think that the Brotherhood, create, while not directly violent, creates a breeding ground, a fertile environment, which that makes it easier for more radical groups to recruit um, now, the Germans, uh, if, if you look at this from uh, as a spectrum, the Germans are on one extreme of the spectrum as having a very broad mandate and therefore very concerned about the Brotherhood. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I would see certain countries in which the intelligence agency has a very narrow mandate, only has to look at terrorism. And in that case, I, uh, I can understand why they are prevented. From looking at the Brotherhood over do so only in passing. And I think then a lot of other agencies fall somewhere in between. Yeah, I, I would have a really hard time trying to fit looking at the Brotherhood into my old services mandate. It's quite clear that when it comes to justification for launching investigations, there's four main grounds. So clearly they're not foreign intelligence organizations. They're not foreign interference per se, although one could argue that. They're borderline terrorism, but you have to have really good grounds to make that case. So I would think that, and I would think the FBI in the States, I mean, I don't know them as well, but they'd also have a hard time, given their First Amendment rights and everything else, they'd have a really tough time looking at the Muslim Brotherhood. So let me ask you a very unfair question. I'm going to put you on the spot, Lorenzo. In some countries, the Brotherhood is indeed listed as a terrorist organization. I think those countries are largely in Central Asia, if memory serves me correct. 
uh, in your opinion, in the Arab world also a few countries in the Arab world. Right. In, in your opinion, again, this is unfair, and I'm sure I'm going to get a very nuanced answer in, in, in response, which is probably the best one right now. Do you think at, in, in its heart of hearts, do you think the Muslim Brotherhood actually qualifies as a terrorist organization in the same way that the obvious ones do, like Al-Qaeda, uh, Islamic State, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Or is that an unfair question to ask? No, it, it's not an unfair question at all. And it, it has very, very practical policy implications. It is something debated in, uh, in, in, uh, in a few countries, at least in the West. I think, generally speaking, my first gut reaction is that uh, it should not be put on the same level as most groups. Um, having said that, uh, let me give you a, a couple of layers of nuance to that. First of all, we talked about brotherhoods. We talked about how branch A can be very different from branch B and branch C. I think it is fair to, to, to talk about certain branches of the brotherhood in certain specific countries where the terrorism designation is not unfair. Hamas has been designated for more than 20 years in most Western countries. Absolutely. Hamas is the Palestinian branch of the Brotherhood. I mentioned earlier Libya, Syria, and Yemen. Those are three countries in which the Brotherhood has consistently engaged in, in terrorist activities, often in conjunction with jihadist groups. Uh, I obviously then I, I look at certain other branches of the Brotherhood, like the one in, uh, in Algeria, in Tunisia, or in Jordan, then that's a different story, and I think that becomes very uh, a big stretch to try to put them in the same category. Right. Um, I, 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 but I think we're, we're thinking in a way that it's very black or white, which is either you're a designated terrorist organization or you're, 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 you're great, you're in the Boy Scouts. Uh, and I think with the Brotherhood, is, as everything with the Brotherhood, it's a gray area. And I like the approach that some continental European countries have taken. Uh, I mentioned the Germans, but I can think of the, the Austrians, the Dutch, um, which is an organization where they look at the Brotherhood as an organization that should be monitored. Uh, of course, again, this is within the law and within the mandate. And I understand that right. in, Canada, in the US, it might be different. Uh, but something, an organization that is problematic, um, that should not be treated as, as a partner, uh, that was what happened in some countries. I, if I think of how the British were looking at Brotherhood offshoots in the UK as fantastic partners to defeat radicalization, and that was sort of the, the mantra 10, 15 years ago. I think that's uh, that's something I strongly disagree. That's an approach I strongly disagree with. Um, so something in between, something policymakers should be aware of. I think it's a very complicated organization, and I always see cases in which uh, policymakers, security services engage with without even knowing who they're dealing with. So they think the organization so-and-so is a nice, moderate, representative Muslim organization without realizing that the background is really a brotherhood spin-off and they, that engagement brings in legitimacy, funds, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I like very much the way you put that. It is complicated. It is multiple shades of gray. Certainly in my time with the security service, we did work with community members and we obviously tried to find the ones, first of all, that would talk to us. And many communities would not talk to us. They thought we were the spawn of Satan and that we hated, we were Islamophobic and just hated Islam, which of course was untrue. But it, I think it was very difficult for us even to determine with whom we were speaking. We didn't know in this area of the backgrounds, so like you said, we could find ourselves in a situation like they did in the UK, where they overtly maybe sought out the Brotherhood as a moderate partner to deal with. But in many other cases, you simply didn't know enough to know that these people were in fact linked to the Brotherhood. So uh, I guess the, the bottom line is that it's, it's complicated. Not only is it complicated with respect to what Brotherhood out of the Brotherhoods you're dealing with, but more importantly, who's who in the zoo and how do you make that determination? And so I guess going forward, you know, what recommendations would you make to governments and security services and law enforcement services in the West on how to deal with this particularly complex situation? It is indeed very difficult. I think the first step is knowledge, as you said. It's having an understanding of a very complicated word, the, the who's who. I mean, nobody shows up and says, hi, I'm a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Here's my business card. <laughs> That's not how it works. It does work like that in the Middle East, uh, but in the West, nobody uh, does that. 
So it's a matter of doing what some services, again, I bring up the Germans, but I think others do, which is tracking these groups and the ever-changing jungle of organizations, acronyms, individuals, and uh, mapping it out and understanding uh, uh, who's who. Uh, and of course, the connections at time becomes become 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 very complicated to 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 understand. Is somebody who was once on the board of a brotherhood organization a brotherhood member? How do you know? I mean, how do, what, what's the, where do you set the place the bar? So it's it's very complicated. Uh, and then once you have a better understanding, which cannot be 100% complete, but a better understanding, I think how to behave depends on uh, the, what organization you are and what your goals are. Uh, I'm not one of those where are some of the critics of the Brotherhood. And I'm, I'm definitely a critic of the Brotherhood, but I'm not in agreement with some of those who argue that you should not work with them, don't talk to them, isolated. I, I think that's, uh, that's not a realistic position and actually I could see this counterproductive. They do exist. They do represent a cross-section um, of the Muslim community, although they don't represent the entire Muslim community as they would like us to believe. Uh, and there is some room uh, for some good results in, in dealing with them. Of course, you got to know who you talk to. You got to know what they want, who they are. And then you might find some good, and I think in the security realm in particular, um, you, there are some uh, good reasons to work with them. But there's a fine line between tactical cooperation and strategic partnership as giving these organizations carte blanche, leg giving them legitimacy, making them as uh, your strategic partners. Because they will use that to enhance their agenda, which is at the end of the day problematic. So that's a big debate that takes place in a lot of security services, particularly in Europe, uh, which is on radicalization prevention, de-radicalization. Right. Do you work right. with these entities or not? And again, it's not a simple answer. And often you, you want to operate on a case-by-case -case basis, make an assessment on the specific circumstances, specific goal you want to obtain, specific local dynamics, um, and there's the short-term goal at time of achieving some security results needs to be seen in the perspective also of not giving a platform in the long term uh, to these organizations. Not easy. I'm really, glad, I'm really glad you said that because certainly I know that in my experience, if we talk to a certain community leader, they would use that to say, hey, if CSIS is talking to me, I must be okay, right? There must be nothing wrong with me. Lorenzo, we could talk about this uh, for a long time. I know you've written several books on the topic. Uh, if you could leave my listeners with uh, as, a sense as to where your research is going now, what you're focusing on, and what you hope to accomplish in the, in the near future in your continuing studies on the Brotherhood, particularly the Brotherhood in the West. Well, I have good timing because I have a new book that came out a couple of months ago. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. It's called The Close Circle, Joining and Leaving the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, and came out through Columbia University Press. And I, I took a different approach. So I had a previous book on the same topic that came out 10 years ago. But this time I did something different, which is talking to some 15 former members of the Muslim Brotherhood in the West. So these are individuals who are, for the most part, sworn members of the Brotherhood. They were part of the inner circle. Uh, different countries, no Canada, unfortunately, sorry. Uh, but United States, Sweden, uh, UK, France. Uh, and with all of them, I spent at least a day. Uh, with some of them, I spent more than one day. Uh, and I got them to tell me their, uh, their life story, how and why they joined, what was life inside, and how and why they left. And I think for a group that is as secretive as the Muslim Brotherhood, that, that is one of the best approaches that one can use to try to understand more. I mean, uh, with the caveat, of course, of biases that former members might have, um, it, it's really important to try to get uh, an insider's view as to how these groups operate. Uh, so well, that's, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be shamelessly pitch by your work. <laughs> no, of course. Well, congratulations, first of all, to dealing to, for the fact you dealt with primary data. I, a lot of uh, people in your field don't do that, unfortunately. And secondly, you're right. I mean, you know, welcome to working for a security service, right? Because you talk to person A, Obviously, there are biases, there's a story they want to get across, there's an influence that they want to have on you. 
And it's often difficult to determine how much truth is in there. But uh, congratulations on the book. I'm going to put a link to it on, on this podcast. And I, I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I've wanted to do this for, for quite some time. And as I said, I, I can't think of anybody who knows the, bro- the Brotherhood, especially in the West, better than you do. So I just want to say thanks, Lorenzo, for being on the podcast. Thank you very much, Phil. It was really, really interesting. Good talking to you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. So that was my conversation with Lorenzo Vedino. Do you have any any thoughts on this? Do you have any experience yourself with a brother? Are you a brotherhood member? You want and you want to push back against what, what he said? You can reach me on Gmail, borealisrisk at gmail.com, or you can reach me also on Twitter at Borealis Saves. You'll also find me on Facebook and on LinkedIn. If you want to subscribe to all the content I have, podcasts, blogs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, Please go to my website, www.borealisthreatrisk.com. Hit the subscribe button, fill in your email address. You'll get a free daily digest every day. The Today in Terrorism series, podcasts such as this, shorter quick hits podcasts, all the material delivered to you, no charge at all. I'll talk again soon. Until then, stay safe.